coming. Recently, I introduced Senate Bill 1281, which will abolish the death penalty in Pennsylvania. Polls show that there's a 15 to 20 percent drop in support for capital punishment nationwide, and juries in state after state are increasingly reluctant to sentence defendants to death, imposing a, only 106 death sentences in 2009, down from a high of 328 in 1994. What is driving this dissipation of support for our ultimate punishment? And why do I feel that my abolition bill will ultimately succeed where previous attempts have not? As a more liberal member of the legislature, I must admit that the sea change in attitudes and my optimism comes from the increasing skepticism of capital punishment on the part of conservatives. There are well-known what they call liberal arguments for eliminating the death penalty. It is inhumane, it is immoral, it is disproportionately imposed upon racial minorities and the poor. But what has changed the dynamic is the newfound traction of conservative arguments against the death penalty. The first principle of modern conservatism is reducing the size and cost of government. Viewed through, through that prism, the death penalty is just another government program that's too expensive and it's just not working. Imposing, death, imposing the death penalty costs between two and three million dollars more per de defendant than life in prison. Nationwide, only about one out of every 10 death sentences is ultimately carried out, raising the cost of each execution to between 20 and 250 million dollars per execution, depending on the state. And what are the taxpayers getting for their money? Well, not much. In the modern era, California has executed 13 people at a cost of 250 million dollars per execution. Maryland has spent 186 million dollars to execute five people. In Pennsylvania, we have spent hundreds of millions of dollars putting 355 people on death row. But we've only executed three people in the past 48 years, all of whom asked to be executed. It has been 48 years, I say again, since we have executed anyone who has not asked to die. Maryland found that each death penalty cost, as I said before, between two and three million dollars over the cost of a non-capital murder case. That's according to a 2008 Urban Institute study. If our costs are similar to Maryland's, and we have every reason to believe that they are, and we have put 355 people on death row, that means we have spent between 700 million and 1.2 billion dollars, 1.2 billion dollars, on a death penalty in the past 30 years, all to execute zero people who did not want to die. Conserv noted conservative leader Richard Vickery recently opined, the death penalty is, after all, a system set up under laws established by politicians. Conservatives have every reason to believe that the death penalty system is no different from any other government-run operation, which we conservatives know is rife with waste and injustice. Beyond that, even states with the highest execution rates have not seen their murder rates drop disproportionately to the demographically similar states without the death penalty. In fact, the states with the highest execution rates, Texas and Oklahoma, continue to have murder rates well above the national average. Another problem with the death penalty, of course, is that its error rate is so high, is unacceptably high, for a penalty with such finality. Since 1973, well over 100 people have been freed from death row after being found to have been completely innocent, and we have one of those people here speaking today, of the charges that sent them there, often but not always through DNA testing. It is interesting to contemplate that of all the cases where people were freed because of DNA testing, DNA is not available at all in two-thirds of the cases, which means that many, many people statistically would be, have been innocent, yet unable to prove that innocence because of the lack of the, of the scientific, uh, the unavailability of the scientific evidence. It is also important to know that we did not have the scientific evidence when we reinstated the death penalty in 1978, 32 years ago. And so we didn't know for sure how inaccurate our criminal justice system was. But when we see person after person, and people read the newspapers, they see every week or two in the newspaper there's another big story, not always death row, sometimes it's just prison, of some person who's been in jail 10, 20, 30 years who's been released because DNA finally exonerates them completely. When we have such an imperfect criminal justice system, is it right to have a penalty that is so irrevocable? If we put someone in jail erroneously, 
and we find out they're innocent. They've lost some time, but at least we can release them and maybe attempt to compensate them in some way for the time they've lost. If a person has been executed, however, there is nothing we can do to make up for the injustice that's been, the injustice that's been committed.